Well, good morning. My name is Brian Graber, and I am an engineer and geomorphologist with American Rivers. And if you don't know what a geomorphologist is, you can just call me a river scientist. That's fine. Um, we take pride in American Rivers in the fact that we not only work at the state level and the federal level to help make dam removals easier in general, but we also get our hands dirty. So we work directly on project management. We provide some level of a te technical assistance, sometimes design assistance on projects. Um, as an engineer and geomorphologist, I've worked on about 45 completed dam removals. I've worked on those closely over the last 15 years. I'm currently working on 10 very closely in the Northeast. And I have uh, provided some level of technical assistance probably in another, I don't know, 70 or 80 dam removal projects. So we've been very engaged in this for about 15 years now at American Rivers. And when you think about removing dams, you can probably think of several reasons why you might want to remove a dam. Um, things like river health, fisheries health, restoring populations of uh, fish and other species. It's also river recreation. There are very few extended paddleable stretches of river in the country, in fact. Um, so removing a dam can help bring back uh, water trails and so on. And then finally, dam safety. Many, many dams are um, getting old, decrepit, and are failing on their own. Um, so we're actively removing many of those structures. But taking on a project can be intimidating. You typically have to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars. There is, for those of you who have not been involved with the project before, the regulatory process can seem like a black box when you get into it. And you've probably heard stories about projects that have been long delayed, that have take, taken decades or more to complete. But in actuality, these projects can be really fun and rewarding. It's not often that we get to go out and stand in a river and take something out by hand, but um, even when you don't do it that way, um, these are fun and rewarding projects. As, as one of my colleagues at the EPA likes to say, when a dam is removed, an angel gets her wings. <laughs> so my goal for the next uh, couple sessions that we have uh, before lunch and after lunch is primarily to talk about the various aspects that go into taking a dam, taking a dam out, um, the, how to set up a project, how to um, do some of the scoping, how to hire consultants to do scoping work for you, to do the actual design work and construction. And primarily, it's just to eliminate that intimidation that you might feel if you haven't been involved with a project before. So that's, that's our goal for the, these two sessions coming up. So in this one, I'm going to talk about why we care about dams, why dam owners care about dam removal. I'm going to talk a little bit about just the general process that goes into setting up a project. And then we're going to do an exercise um, looking at a couple of dams for the things that you would look at to decide whether this is an easy project or a difficult project um, as a dam removal. So why remove dams? Ecological reasons. This is our free-flowing river. We have uh, diversity of aquatic life. And forgive me, this is the best I could do with PowerPoint for, to show a diversity of aquatic life. <laughs> That's a diversity of aquatic life in our free-flowing river. You put a dam on this river, and instantly you've blocked passage of those species that need to move, not only for um, migratory reasons to move to spawn, but also to move to get away from events like droughts and floods um, and to uh, um, move to different habitats throughout their life cycle. So juvenile fish usually need different habitats from adult fish. They need to be able to move to get to those habitats. And so, hence the term. The joke that I will soon retire because nobody laughs at it anymore. But all this water sitting and pounded, um, especially in the sun during the summer, it warms up. And warmer water means lower dissolved oxygen in that water. It's an indirect relationship. So as water temperature goes up, the oxygen in that water goes down. That affects not only in the impoundment itself, so the pond behind the dam, it also affects what flows downstream. So the both, um, that temperature effect can have both a direct effect on species that are in the impoundment or downstream and can also have a, that effect on dissolved oxygen. So this guy's saying it's hot. Dams are also really effective at trapping material that moves downstream, so sediment, nutrients, debris, so on. Dams can trap up to 95% of the material depending on the structure of the dam. 
With that material comes nutrients. As it starts to fill up, you get a shallower water body behind the dam. And as you get shallower and the nutrients trapped behind there, you start to get vegetation growth. Along with the vegetation growth, you get alg algal blooms frequently in the summer in impoundments. This creates an additional dissolved oxygen <coughs> feedback loop where as the vegetation decays, as the algae decays, and as it respires it during the night, it additionally consumes more dissolved oxygen that additionally helps to reduce the oxygen levels for species in, um, in impoundments and downstream. And then there are fish that don't normally live in rivers that move into these areas. This is meant to, uh, to be Asian carp. And these guys really like that setup. So it completely changes the, the assemblage in, um, in that river. So all the things that we think about that make up river health, and there are really four things that we think about. It's connectivity of habitat, complexity of habitat, water quality, and the flow regime, or having enough water at the right times in the river. Dams impact all of those things. And as a result, we've seen um, cumulative effects you can see all the dams in, in Maryland. Cumulative effects, that not just on uh, fish passage, but also on water quality with those dissolved oxygen impacts. And so you, you can just imagine looking at this, what this has done to aquatic species um, throughout Maryland, but also throughout much of the country. And the result is that fish populations have declined. So migratory species like herring, sturgeon, um, shad, so on, salmon in, in the further up the Northeast. They've all declined to levels that are 5% of what we measured in the past, so probably even more um, than a fi down to 5% of what um, we now see. Species like American eel, which also migrate from the ocean, um, they, are, they have been reviewed for endangered species status because of population declines, and I think they're again being reviewed. They're again being reviewed for endangered species status. Um, so that's for migratory fish. And then for non-migratory fish like brook trout, their populations have also declined dramatically. Um, it's currently about 5% of intact habitat for brook trout in the headwaters of our rivers also, largely as a result of dams. Dams also have an effect on non-fish species like mussels as well. Um, the National Biological Service has stated that dams and pollution are among the most significant reasons why mussel populations have declined. And so the um, response I often get is, well, why not just put a fish ladder on these dams and call it done? We can get fish moving up and downstream. Well, there are a number of reasons why a dam removal is much more effective than putting a fish ladder on a dam. And one of the biggest is that if you put a fish ladder on the dam, you're not bringing back that habitat and you're not affecting the water quality effects of having a dam there. So you're not getting back that dissolved oxygen, you're not fixing the temperature regime. Um, but also, there are a number of other reasons, and I think the biggest is that when you put a fish ladder on a, on a dam, you are at that point getting approximately, usually for most fish ladders, something like 40 or 50% efficiency. So 40 or 50% of the, of the single species that the fish ladder is meant to help that are moving upstream are able to get past that fish ladder and, and move further upstream. That's for most fish ladders. So you consider you get 40 to 50% of passage in an upstream direction for that single species, once you get through three, four, or five dams moving up a river, your population is um, severely declined. But also, um, fish ladders require maintenance. And in order to be consistently maintained for decades, um, you have to have consistent staff and consistent budgets, which obviously becomes a problem over a long period of time. And so what we have found is that Fish ladders are only really maintained well on dams that are serving an important economic purpose. So that's things like flood control dams, hydropower dams. And those are actually a very small percentage of the number of dams that are out there. So in the NID, which is the National Inventory of Dams, the database maintained by the Army Corps and FEMA of um, the largest dams around the country, for the largest dams, about 3% of those dams provide hydropower or were built for that purpose, and about 15% provide flood control. Now, there are other purposes also, like water supply, um, recreation, of course. But it's really these dams that are providing a real economic purpose where things like a fish ladder are, are well maintained. And so those are the, the ecological reasons why we care about dams. That's why fishery scientists, why environmental nonprofits, that's why we care about dams. 
But many, many dam owners are also interested in taking out dams, and this is the equation that, um, that we see that results in many, many dam removal projects. Dams are rapidly reaching their design lives. They're not built as structures. They're not built to last forever, and they're rapidly reaching that end point. Um, and decisions will have to be made on whether to repair or maintain or remove a, a structure. So there's some liability attached to dam ownership. There's a cost attached to dam ownership. We have funding available from many sources to remove dams. So the dam safety issue plus funding available for removal means that we are removing dams. And that's probably the biggest reason around the country why dams are being removed. It's not the ecological reasons. Although the funding sources and the groups working on dam removals are there for ecological reasons. Dam owners are usually interested in, in this equation more. And so a little bit more on dam owner interest. Um, dams create liability for their owners in a couple of ways, and one is the, the failure risk. And this shows some examples of uh, dams that have failed or were threatening failure, and I'll show you a couple of these. These are all projects in Massachusetts. You're going to see many of my examples, of course, are from the Northeast where I work. Um, this uh, project in the, this dam on the top left was um, under a dam safety order for repair from the Office of Dam Safety. The dam owner had not followed through with that order. Um, and interestingly, a uh, news crew came to his house one evening and knocked on his door and asked him when he was intending to repair his dam. And uh, he stepped out of his house long enough to say, I'll repair my dam when I win the lottery. So didn't have the funds, didn't have the interest to, to do what was necessary to repair the dam. Just a few weeks after that, his dam failed during the flood, forced the evacuation of residents and businesses downstream. Um, still hasn't been repaired. They've uh, taken out the majority of the structure. On the top right, this was a dam that uh, this uh, owner bought at an auction for about $40,000, thinking that he was buying a swimming pond. <laughs> Not re realizing that along with that swimming pond came a high hazard dam, high hazard meaning that if it failed, it had the potential to kill people downstream. Um, so not realizing the property transfer, that that's what he was actually purchasing. Um, shortly after he bought that structure, the spillway failed. Fortunately, it wasn't a massive failure, so it did not harm anyone downstream. But that's the spillway portion of the dam that failed. He now has to go out um, every other day to remove debris from the low-level outlet of his structure to make sure that doesn't clog up and cause an additional failure. And still in limbo after several years, um, just continuing to go out and clear debris from his, his outlet. And there is a, uh, a diving board that is suspended out over a dried out impoundment um, a little ways away from that spillway. This uh, dam on the bottom left here was in the news back in 2005. This is the Wittenden Dam on the Mill River in Taunton, Massachusetts. And if you look really closely, um, during a flood, this dam almost failed. It forced the evacuation of 2,000 people down, uh, from downtown Taunton. And that is uh, Senator Kennedy, Senator Kerry, Mitt Romney, our former governor of Massachusetts, all standing at the edge of the dam trying to decide what to do about it as it was in imminent failure. Um, and then a bunch of kids down, downtown making fun of the whole situation after the evacuation, walk around with life jackets, surfboards, and, and flippers. If you're a dam owner, you don't want to be one of these dam owners. And the fact is, for many dam owners now, um, their dams are no longer providing an economic purpose for them. The many, perhaps most, dams were built decades to centuries ago for a purpose that is, it's no longer meeting. So they were built to power mills. The mills have long since gone out of business, but the uh, dams remain on the rivers, and they have owners attached to them. Um, some dams also have insufficient spillway capacity, so they were built decades, centuries ago when they didn't have modern safety standards for how much water a dam should be able to pass during a flood, and they need significant upgrades to meet those safety standards. And so you can see a couple of these, an uh, aging dam in, in Connecticut, the dam owner that doesn't know what to do with it, that um, does not make money off of the structure, and that is a, a spillway failure on the right side there because the, a spillway that had insufficient capacity for the flow. So there's a, a liability attached to the potential failure of a dam, but then there's also liability attached to when a dam is just sitting in place as an attractive nuisance, as a fun place to play on and around for, for many people. 
Um, you can see on the top right here, oh, by the way, yeah, there we go. These kids right here, for scale, kids for scale, um, this dam is about 16 feet high. When I came out to this site, these kids here were sliding down the face of this dam. Looked like a lot of fun, but um, not safe. Dams create, many dams create, if they're, if they're set up um, in this way, many dams create hydraulics or rollers downstream. If you get stuck in those rollers, you can't get yourself back out. And that's actually what happened on the bottom right there. Um, this is on the Des Moines River in I Iowa back in 2010. This is an amazing Pulitzer Prize winning photo of um, an old couple had gone over a dam, gone over the dam um, in their boat and had spilled out of it and got caught in the roller downstream. And there just happened to be a construction crew nearby with a crane. And uh, that's the, one of the construction workers rescuing the woman. Um, unfortunately, her husband ended up drowning um, at this time also. A little bit more humorous note. It's a little bit hard to see, but I'll point out what's here. This is a dam in Connecticut on the Coggenshaw River. That right there is a small child. That right there is a board wedged into the side of the dam. You put that all together, it's another attractive nuisance liability for a dam owner. On a less humorous note, um, this is the Coloco Dam that breached in 2006 in Hawaii. Um, it sent about, I think it was 370 million gallons of water downstream rapidly when it failed. Ended up killing seven people downstream. And the uh, um, problem with this site was that the dam owner um, did not listen to the Office of Dam Safety in Hawaii and had started building structures on his emergency spillway, which gave the water nowhere to go, caused the dam to fail, and um, this dam owner is still on trial for manslaughter and reckless endangerment, um, seven counts of that. So you add all this up, it just means that dam owners are often interested in removing dams um, for liability, for public safety, for failure risk, and for um, risk of attractive nuisances. Um, and they just really don't want to deal with something that's not providing them an economic benefit. And so there's something, some responsibility that they have, if there's something that they pay for, repairs, um, inspections, so on, then they often choose to remove their dams instead of continue to, to do those repairs and maintenance and have that liability. Especially if someone else is bringing in the funding, which is what we often do at American Rivers and some of the other groups here. And so there are a number of reasons why um, dam owners are interested in, in dam removal, usually having to do with costs of the liability, maintenance, repair, inspections, repeated repairs, and so on. And the real benefit of removing a dam is that it's a one-time cost. So usually repairing, a significant repair in a structure costs more than dam removal, but even in cases when dam removal costs more than that repair, removing a dam is a one-time thing. Once you take the dam out, it's gone, there's no longer any cost at that site, usually. Um, as opposed to when you repair a structure, it's gonna need repeated repairs in the future as well. So we've been removing a lot of dams. I think our latest count, it's about right, 1,110 dams in the country we've removed. Pretty close. All right. We being the collective community of dam removal experts. This is not just American Rivers, but let me rephrase. 1,110 dams have been removed around the country. Um, the majority of those in the last uh, 15 years or so. And if you look at the total number of dams that are out there, it's uh, something like 99,000, 100,000 dams in the country, we think, based on the, um, putting together databases and expectation for what is missing from those databases. Um, we've removed, again, the broader we, have removed uh, maybe 1% of dams that are out there. And here's what one of those looks like. I'll say that again. This is a site in, um, on an Atlantic salmon spawning river in Massachusetts, Yoakum Brook. You can see at this site we had um, a retaining wall along the left side of the river that was in bad shape and needed, needed to be maintained, and so we left a portion of the dam in place to um, help provide some stability to that, to that wall. <clears throat> 